Good evening. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. I'm Bill Lacey, the director of the Institute. We're delighted you could join us tonight for what's going to be really an outstanding program. We have an excellent schedule of spring semester programs planned. 10 score, the 2009 presidential lecture series, will focus on Abraham Lincoln during the bicentennial of his birth. Our kickoff is Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. with former Dole Institute and Lincoln Library Director Richard Norton Smith. Additional programs are listed on the back of your or additional programs are listed on the back of your program for tonight's event. We're taking a new approach with study groups this year. Uh, watch for an announcement soon about a study group titled Obama's First 100 Days. It will be jointly led. It will be the only study group that we conduct, and it will actually run through uh, a large part of April. So it will kind of look up close and personal at the president's first 100 days, which, as most of you know, is historically usually the most significant for presidents. As always, I have a few requests for you tonight. Please turn off your cell phones. You don't want to embarrass yourself in front of all of your friends sitting next to you. We appreciate that. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for a microphone uh, to be brought to you. We ask you to do that not only so the speaker can hear the questions clearly, but as I think most of you know, we uh, uh, digitally record all of our programs and put them on our website, and it allows us to get your question on the website. So, And finally, uh, if you do get a chance to ask a question, uh, we say please do ask a question. Don't make a statement. No filibustering allowed. We're delighted tonight that both our chancellor and our provost uh, have joined us for the program. So thank you, gentlemen, and thank you, Jan, for coming out. Uh, we get an extraordinary number of our speakers from friends at the university or in the community. And uh, tonight is uh, another example of that. So I'd like to thank uh, retired KU professor of special education, Gary Clark, for helping bring our guest tonight. Gary, where are you? Wave at everybody. Gary, thank you very much. Our format tonight will be a little bit different. Uh, our guest will come out and make a brief presentation, which will include some very powerful uh, DVD clips. Uh, and then we'll be joined by our associate director, Barbara Ballard, uh, who will be interviewing him. Uh, and the final section of the program will be your Q&A. And we'll also be having a book signing immediately afterwards uh, where you can pick up a copy of uh, what is really a fascinating book. In 2004, State Senator Barack Obama gave what was arguably one of the greatest Democratic National Convention keynote speeches in history. I say arguably because in 1976, the first African-American woman keynoted the convention. It was Congresswoman Barbara Jordan. She gave a stem winder widely considered the best before 2004. Uh, I was, as all of you know, I am a first-class political junkie. And I was watching the Democratic Convention and saw that and was absolutely amazed by the power, the rhetorical power that she demonstrated. This is Black History Month, of course, so it's fitting that in the historic year that President Obama assumes office that we recognize the contributions of individuals who helped pave the way. And Congresswoman Barbara Jordan was one of them. Who better to discuss the Congresswoman than a former colleague of her in the State Senate and also someone who worked with her at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Now, I first heard of Dean Max Sherman in 1987 when I was running Bob Dole's 1988 presidential campaign. I was approached by a representative of the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas about a major oral history project on the campaign. I agreed to participate. Dean Sherman's name came up frequently over the course of my interviews, and eventually I was asked to serve on the advisory board of that project. Dean Sherman was dean of the LBJ School from July 1983 until September 1997. Prior to his appointment at the school, he was special counsel to the governor of Texas. He served in the state senate from 1971 to 1977, leaving in 77 to become president of West Texas State University. He has a JD degree from the University of Texas at Austin and a BA in history from Baylor University. He has an extraordinary list of leadership positions that he's held and awards that he has won. 
During his tenure as state senator, Sherman was recognized by Texas Monthly in 1973, 1975, and 1977 as one of the ten best legislators. The magazine cited his integrity, intelligence, and genuine sense of public service. Max will be signing a copy of his book immediately after the program. Please welcome Dean Max Sherman. Bill, thank you very much. <clears throat> and I particularly want to thank Bill and Barbara Ballard and the Dole Institute of Politics because this is the beginning of a Black History Month at a very historical time. And there's no better setting than to be in a venue that represents the le legacy of an American history maker, and that's in Senator Bob Dole. And I'm here to talk about another American history maker, a former Congresswoman Barbara Jordan. It's a very significant time, and what I'd like to do is just to very briefly share with you some words that are not my own. I've never used them before, but they're part of a letter that Alice Walker wrote to President-elect Barack Obama. As he was, this is the day after he was elected, and just a few lines from that because I think it puts things in context. Dear Brother Obama, you have no idea, really, of how profound this moment is for us. But seeing you deliver the torch, so many others before you carried, year after year, decade after decade, century after century, only to be struck down before igniting the flame of justice and of law, is almost more than the heart can bear. And yet, this observation is not intended to burden you, for you are of a different time, and indeed, because of all the relay runners before you, North America is a different place. So in many ways, when I get to talk to you tonight about Barbara Jordan, it's for a different place in a different time. And even though the book was written at another time, I think its relevancy for what we're doing today is so very important. And since she was one of the torch carriers, one of those people in the relay, one of those people upon whom other people's shoulders she stood, what I'd like to do, and Bill referred to it, is to let you be introduced to Barbara Jordan as she introduced herself to that speech and to that convention in 1976. So these are the words of Barbara Jordan. This would be our clip number one. Gentlemen, in case you don't know it, may I now present our second keynote speaker, the Honorable Barbara Jordan, Democrat of Houston, Texas. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for a very warm reception. It was 144 years ago that members of the Democratic Party first met in convention to select a presidential candidate. Since that time, Democrats have continued to convene once every four years and draft a party platform and nominate a presidential candidate. And our meeting this week is a continuation of that tradition. But there is something different about tonight. There is something special about tonight. What is different? What is special? I, Barbara Jordan, am a keynote speaker. When, um, a lot of years passed since 1832, and during that time it would have been most unusual for any national political party to ask a Barbara Jordan to deliver a keynote address. But tonight, here I am. 
And I feel, I feel that notwithstanding the past, that my presence here is one additional bit of evidence that the American dream need not forever be deferred. you that I knew what I'm going to mention to you at this moment that when I did this book uh, it was done to, for Barbara Jordan students it was never done for a broader audience like this and the clip that you've just seen is part of a DVD that's in the back of it and as I pointed out to a group earlier today uh, it's not a book I get any proceeds from because all the proceeds go to the uh, Austin Presbyterian Seminary for a Center for Proclamation and Worship and the reason it goes there is that Barbara loved powerful preaching and she loved spirited hymn singing. So those are all those things that are there. So in a way, when you hear on that DVD, uh, it's a chance to really hear all of the speeches. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of each of them. But what I did not know when I did the book, and one of her students called me and asked if I was familiar with a study done by the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where they asked 135 scholars to rank the top 100 speeches of the 20th century. 100 speeches out of 100 years. And those scholars all did that. And when they came together, this speech was number five. What was number one? Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream. Number two was Kennedy's inaugural. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what can you do for your country? Number three was Franklin Roosevelt's first inaugural when he said at the time when the country was in a Great Depression that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And number four was Franklin Roosevelt's speech after the bombing of Pearl Harbor when he said it was a day to be remembered in infamy. And this speech was number five. So even though I had done the book, I knew Barbara for 25 years, I'd worked with her in many ways, I had to go back and look and analyze the speech and try to figure out what did they see in it that they ranked it ahead of her speech on Watergate which was ranked number 13. So two of the top 15 speeches of the century are speeches of Barbara Jordan. So I'm just going to let the next three clips play because I think these are some of the insights as to why they ranked it so high. It was not a speech to Democrats. It really was a speech to us as a better society, how we can be better at what we do and how a democracy can work better. So these are three clips we'll just play back to back. We are a party. We are a party of innovation. We do not reject our traditions, but we are willing to adapt to changing circumstances when change we must. We are willing to suffer the discomfort of change in order to achieve a better future. We have a positive vision of the future founded on the belief that the gap between the promise and reality of America can one day be finally closed. We believe that. <laughs> this, my friends, is the bedrock of our concept of governing. This is a part of the reason why Americans have turned to the Democratic Party. These are the foundations upon which a national community can be built. Let all understand that these guiding principles cannot be discarded for short-term political gains. They represent what this country is all about. They are indigenous to the American idea, and these are principles which are not negotiable. In other times, in other times, I could stand here and give this kind of exposition on the beliefs of the Democratic Party, and that would be enough. But today, that is not enough. People want more. That is not sufficient reason for the majority of the people of this country to decide to vote Democratic. We have made mistakes. We realize that. We admit our mistakes. 
in our haste to do all things for all people, we did not foresee the full consequences of our actions. And when the people raised their voices, we didn't hear. But our deafness was only a temporary condition and not an irreversible condition. This speech and the one that she gave in 1992 to the Democratic Convention was her second keynote. She actually gave two keynotes before the one that Barack Obama gave. And they both were criticized by people of my party, the Democratic Party, for being too mild. They were not partisan enough. They were not hard-hitting enough. But Barbara was not speaking just to Democrats. She really was speaking to the nation, to that better element that is in all of us. There's a little aside that I'd like to make, though, but there are some people in this audience who probably follow politics and Bill would know this, but uh, does anyone happen to remember who the uh, second keynote speaker was in 1976? A very talented astronaut named John Glenn who was really had his own pre presidential aspirations at that point, and the fact that he followed Barbara Jordan probably was the end of his beginning and the end of his presidential career. There's an old adage in politics that you never want to be on the program after the banjo player. And, and he just happened to be in that role at that time. I mentioned that she was not partisan, but uh, there were a couple of things I've always tried to point out to my Democratic friends is that when she spoke in 76, the party nominated a governor from a small state with few electoral votes. And at that time, that governor defeated an incumbent president of the United States, which very rarely happens, and that was Jimmy Carter. 1992, the party, after she gave a keynote address, elected as a nominee another governor from a small state, the state of Arkansas, and again, that governor defeated an incumbent president of the United States. So the most partisan thing I might say tonight is that I did write a letter to Howard Dean suggesting that they piece together a third in all keynote for Barbara to give at the convention last year. Now, they didn't need it, but it might have still been a good idea. But I mentioned she was not partisan. The speeches were criticized, but Barbara was a very committed Democrat. And when she almost drowned in 1988, uh, most people thought she would not live. And, uh, and she was in the hospital. And there's a picture in the campus paper at the University of Texas. And she's beaming, smile, and the young reporter asks her a question, how she's feeling. And she says, oh, I feel great. It's a Democrat year, and I've got to be around to celebrate it. And so that was part of her partisan and it's her, in order to be neutral about it, I'm going to tell a story that's from a book about Ronald Reagan, and one of his favorite stories was a story about a lady named Miss O'Shaughnessy, and she grew up in Boston with immigrant parents, uh, very staunch Democrats, always voted a straight Democratic ticket, and she made money and some money and was able to educate her children. And her young son came to pick her up one day to go vote, and he said, well, Mom, and he had at that point began to, to split his ticket. He says, how are you going to vote? And she says, well, I'm going to vote straight Democrat. And he said, Mom, he said, if Jesus Christ came back and ran as a Republican, you wouldn't vote for him? Hush, he wouldn't change his party after all these years. <laughs> Let me just now move briefly because we're going to have a long opportunity to have questions and answers in the interview with Barbara. But what I'd like to do now is to move to another clip in just a moment. But I want to first tell you, because this is the one I thought would have been rated first. It's the one that most of us can quote, part of the lines that she gave in that remarkable speech uh, talking about impeachment for President Nixon. But in many ways, her even being on that committee was a perfect storm. Through the good efforts of Lyndon Johnson, she was put on the House Judiciary Committee, which normally a freshman would not get to be on. And she's only in the last part of her first two-year term. She's still 39 years old at this time, 38. And she is the one on that committee because Democrats had more than enough votes to vote articles of impeachment. But it was Barbara Jordan who said, this is too important. We don't play with the Constitution. We don't play with impeachment. And so we want to do our homework. We want to do, get all the evidence. And she was the one that led the committee from her junior last seat position, number 38 out of a committee of 38, to take more time to look at it. And she eventually did vote for articles of impeachment. But she came after, after, after a very arduous process. And it was a time that they had never had television, televised committee hearings. And it was on a Tuesday night and a Wednesday night. 
And this was about 10 minutes until 9 on that last night, and she was the last to speak. And uh, it was a time when you didn't have text messaging, you didn't have a lot of television, and millions and millions of people were riveted to the television that evening. And these are the words that she had, just one that we probably all will remember, and then I would mention just a couple of things after that. But this is... Earlier today, we heard the beginning of the preamble to the Constitution of the United States. We the people. It's a very eloquent beginning. But when that document was completed on the 17th of September in 1787, I was not included in that we the people. I felt somehow for many years that George Washington and Alexander Hamilton just left me out by mistake. But through the process of amendment, interpretation, and court decision, I have finally been included in We the People. Today I am an inquisitor, and hyperbole would not be fictional and would not overstate the solemnness that I feel right now. My faith in the Constitution is whole, it is complete, it is total. And I am not going to sit here and be an idle spectator to the diminution, the subversion, the destruction of the Constitution. Who can so properly be the inquisitors for the nation as the representatives of the nation themselves? The subjects of its jurisdiction are those offenses which proceed from the misconduct of public men. And that's what we're talking about. In other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. It is wrong, I suggest, it is a misreading of the Constitution for any member here to assert that for a member to vote for an article of impeachment means that that member must be convinced that the President should be removed from office. The Constitution doesn't say that. The powers relating to impeachment are an essential check in the hands of the body, the legislature, against and upon the encroachments of the executive. The division between the two branches of the legislature, the House and the Senate, assigning to the one the right to accuse and to the other the right to judge. The framers of this Constitution were very astute. They did not make the accusers and the judges and the judges the same person. We know the nature of impeachment. We've been talking about it a while now. It is chiefly designed for the president and his high ministers to somehow be called into account. It is designed to bridle the executive if he engages in excesses. It is designed as a method of national inquest into the conduct of public men. The framers confided in the Congress the power, if need be, to remove the president in order to strike a delicate balance between a president swollen with power and grown tyrannical and preservation of the independence of the executive. The nature of impeachment, a narrowly channeled exception to the separation of powers maxim. The Federal Convention of 1787 said that. It limited impeachment to high crimes and misdemeanors and discounted and opposed the term maladministration. It is to be used only for great misdemeanors, so it was said in the North Carolina Ratification Convention. And in the Virginia Ratification Convention, we do not trust our liberty to a particular branch. We need one branch to check the other. Bill Moyer said that from that moment on, the word Constitution was linked to Barbara Jordan. And that uh, he said there was a famous Methodist preacher, this is in the epilogue in the book, uh, that used to be able to bring an audience to tears or to laughter just by saying the word Mesopotamia. And he said Barbara Jordan could do the same by saying the word Constitution. And uh, it became very, very powerful. But what I would like to do now is to tell you a story that occurs after the book was out because when we were trying to put together the DVD and have the speeches one of her speeches was not recorded 
it was her commencement at Howard University about two or three months before the Watergate testimony. It was not recorded by audio or video, so we were trying to find someone to record it. And, one of, and I guess something I shouldn't tell, but I will tell, is that uh, we first uh, submitted it to United States Senator Barack Obama, and he got to his desk, and he is the one who said, don't you think it should be recorded by a woman, not by a man? And so we then moved, and Anna Devere Smith, who's a very talented African-American actress, you will have seen her on West Wing in a number of performances, through a series of friends, she wrote an email, and she said, I would do it in a moment, and she did, at a very fine studio in New York, no charge, she did it on her own. And then she's working on a one-woman play, and that play is one that she came brought to Austin to Zachary Scott Theater. Since I'd never met her, and I've only met her for about three minutes, at that play that evening. It's a play in production dealing with the end of life issues from AIDS and cancer. And she was interviewing former governor Ann Richards who was dying of cancer at the time. And she, each day she would do interviews like she would interview Bill today and they would transcribe it tonight and the next day she would work it into the one woman play. And so at the end of that she had a panel of five to react uh, to what they had seen. And it, about four and a half hours later because a very long evening a young woman asked a question, and in answering it, Anna said, you know, I've always drawn a distinction between hope and a dream. She said, a dream, you get up and you feel good, and, you know, it may not be related to reality, but hope is something that you really think will come about. It has possibility. She said, when I was a young college student, I used to love to go to, to love Shakespeare, and I would go to a rehearsal hall, and I would say the same 14 lines over and over for two to three hours. It would be one of the Shakespearean sonnets. And she had done this on this particular evening. She came back to her room, wherever she was, called her roommate, who was another young African-American college student who was visiting her parents in Colorado. And her roommate said, Anna, did you hear Barbara Jordan tonight? She said, Anna, we are inquisitors. Well, I will tell you that as a white male who's always been included, it never occurred to me the significance of the word inquisitor. But she says, I'm an inquisitor. In those other speeches when she said, I was just left out, most people forget that when the Constitution was written, one of the compromises was that if you were black, you were descendant of slaves, you were written into the Constitution as only three-fifths of a person. It's the way the Constitution was written, and it wasn't changed until the 12th Amendment. If you were a woman in this country, most places in the country, you could not vote until 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment. So she, when she says, I was left out, she was really left out. And I didn't get it until that night at Zachary Scott in Austin, Texas. But those two young women got it immediately. That night, they knew they had been left out. And now one of their own is sitting in judgment of the President of the United States, looking at articles of impeachment. Is a very, very powerful moment. I'm going to move very quickly because I don't want to take too long here where we should be interviewing, but I do want to show you what I think is Barbara Jordan at her very best, Quint quintessential Barbara Jordan. In the book, in the, in the DVD, it's in a section called Extras. You will have her last speech, which was at West Point when she received the Sylvanius Thera Award, which is only given to presidents and chief justices of the Supreme Court and secretaries of defense. She's one of only about three women to receive it. That speech is there, but also the Q&A after she testified against the confirmation of Robert Bork to be appointed to the Supreme Court. And just the brief context for that, you have to remember that Barbara grew up at a time in Houston, Texas, in the Fifth Ward, where she went to segregated public schools. She went to an all-black college at Texas Southern. She went off to University of Boston, came back to practice law, could not practice law in, in any of the law firms in Houston because she was a woman and she was black. When she was a college student, she and her colleague won a national debate tournament defeating Harvard in the finals. They had to travel, colored only restaurants, colored only motels, going and coming. So she had experienced all of the difficulties of race as she was coming along and she cited that. And then she told in that testimony of opposing Bork of her own experience as a 26 year old woman that asked her to run for the legislature. She got, and most of the large cities in the South were designed to keep minorities from being elected. She got 44,000 votes in an at-large district and could not be elected. 
she said, well, if I learn the rules, I'll do better. So two years later, at 28, she runs and gets 64,000 votes. And again, in a large district, could not be elected. She got more votes to be not be elected to the House of Representatives than I got to be elected to the Texas Senate in the 31st Senatorial District. But the system was rigged so that she couldn't get there. And then the Supreme Court has a decision called Baker versus Carr, and they say one person, one vote, it leads to a series of redistricting decisions. Districts are redrawn. She gets elected to the Texas Senate at age 30. And so she gives that background about coming because Robert Bork had testified and written articles saying that Baker versus Carr was wrongly decided. He also had said the decision saying the poll tax was unconstitutional was wrongly decided. She said if Robert Bork had been on the court, I would still be running for the Texas House of Representatives for the 11th time, and again, unsuccessfully. So what you're going to see now, I'm going to play these two clips, and these will be the last ones, uh, where she's testified, and now this is a committee chaired by a very young Joe Biden, and you'll see a very young Orrin Hatch, and you'll see a very young Arlen Specter, but they won't be here. But what you will see is young, the, the junior member of the committee, Gordon Humphrey, very conservative, and he takes her on, and he wishes he had not started down that road. <laughs> My, yes, Senator Humphrey. Which title do you prefer? Com Whichever professor? is comfortable for you. <laughs> you throw it back every time, don't you? Um, all right, uh, Congresswoman uh, Jordan. Um, let's turn to the Cox affair for a moment, if we may. <coughs> I think it's, it's been turned to enough times, but but it was raised again in connection with, uh, in your testimony, in fact, you said that, uh, in your opinion, uh, Robert Bork, as Solicitor General, violated regulations, if not law, was guilty of such violations. If, if, if uh, that is so, if that were so, um, was the Senate wrong in confirming Robert Bork? I mean, that violation of law it's a matter of integrity. And uh, was the Senate wrong in confirming Robert Bork to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals? Senator, in as much as I've never been a member of this august body known as the United States Senate, I don't know whether you were wrong. You might have been. Well, in your uh, opinion. I'm asking in, in your opinion. Uh, I, I, know, I, know, I know what you're asking. But um, what has to be understood is that the qualifications as set out by the ABA for its ranking and rating yes. of persons who are nominated, those qualifications are totally different from what you as a senator must consider when you are looking at the nominee. Yes, and the and, ABA says so. Right, and I would suggest then that the Senate in its collective wisdom apparently decided that given its duty and obligation under the law and its advice and consent function, it was the correct thing for the Senate to do, and I would not second guess it. Okay. Well, but really you're you're evading the question outrageously first you accuse robert bork of violating the law he did violate the law very well then in your opinion should the senate have refused confirmation and what i am saying to you is i am not going to second guess the senate you're, you're not if going the to. senate if the senate wants to confirm a person who has blatantly violated the law the senate must have good reason for doing that what, what possible reason could the Senate have for confirming unanimously someone you claim violated the law? The Senate maybe felt that that was not a serious enough aberration for them to deny confirmation. Oh, you, you really can't be serious. <laughs> you can't be serious on that. Uh, of course I can be. <laughs> I, I've never seen you humorous, I must say, so uh, maybe this is the first time, tongue-in-cheek. Um, well, very well. How about the ABA? As you know, the ABA in 1982 uh, gave Robert Bork the, the uh, highest qualification, the highest possible uh, rating, exceptionally well qualified, EWQ. Uh, was the ABA wrong? If, if, if Robert there, Bork was a criminal, as you suggest? 
Senator Humphrey, I'm not, I'm not calling him a, a criminal. He, he violated an illegal act. Yes. Every action of illegality does not a criminal make. I see. Therefore, I do not call him a, a criminal. And the ABA and its highest rating, there is not a body in the land which, in my judgment, is incapable of being, from time to time, misguided. Indeed, including the Supreme Court, <laughs> as you know, and I'm sure you would admit in the case of some landmark decisions, which have been reversed by one means or another, thank goodness. Um, you're very good. <laughs> <laughs> Professor. Uh, I believe I'll call you Professor. All right. Well, more, let, let's talk about another point. Since I can't get anywhere, although I think I, I could get a lesser person really over a barrel, I can't get you over that barrel. Um, you said something that disturbed me. I don't know if you meant it quite the way you said it, but you said that uh, in, in, re in uh, reference to your own experience as, as one who suffered greatly from uh, discrimination, that, um, I've forgotten how you phrased it, but you said that, uh, I wish I could remember, you said something about you, you personally saw the Supreme Court as the guardian of your rights. Is that a fair paraphrase? I know guardian you, you of our liberties. Guardian of, guardian of our liberties, yes. guardian of the yeah. rights of the yeah. individual. Yeah. I don't quite agree with that, and I think here is the nub of this controversy. I view the Constitution and not judges as the guardian of our freedom, our rights, our liberty. It is not the opinions of judges, personal opinions, which is the guardian of our freedom, I'm sure you will agree, but a carefully crafted document. Senator, you're right, this is the nub of the issue. Got one. Finally, you're right. <laughs> The nub of the issue is this. Many people, particularly weak people, underprivileged, unrepresented, underrepresented, minority people, particularly the ouch, have looked to the Supreme Court yes. as the rescuer. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court will throw out a lifeline when the legislators and the governors and the everybody else yes. refuses to do so. And there is, Senator, historical precedent for viewing the court that way. That precedent goes all the way back to an exchange of letters between Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Thomas Jefferson was all for a Bill of Rights being added to the Constitution. This was during the time yes. of the ratification campaign. Thomas Jefferson was all for it. James Madison said no necessity for it. Thomas Jefferson said, well, let me try to explain to you, Mr. Madison, why we need to put these rights in the Constitution. If we put them there, there will be courts to look at them and see that they are protected from intrusion by the government. Madison bought the argument and said, hooray, we'll do it because there will be independent judicial tribunals protecting the rights. That's where the correspondence starts. You can take it up further. There is a most obscure case that I know you have not seen in your deliberations here. It is a footnote in the Caroline Caroline Products case v. U.S. 
1938 case, the footnote, footnote four, it was so significant that there have been pages and pages written in constitutional texts just about footnote four. What did footnote four say? The judiciary has a special and unique task to protect minorities and people who need protection. And that is where that uniqueness of the judicial body, it comes forth. So yes, I said the Supreme Court is the protector of the rights of the individuals. I believe that the independent tribunal, not subject to the whims of the electorate, not subject to the bias of the electorate, but above that bias and protecting our rights. I think that is the proper function of the court and the reason why so many people affected oppose the nomination of Judge Bork is they do not want to see, we do not want to see an articulate and persuasive voice on the Supreme Court saying, that's not your function. Hell, but uh, President Carter, she had hoped to be named Attorney General, and Carter had already decided to name Griffin Bell and offered her the position of ambassador of the United Nations, which she declined. And later, through Governor Richards, President Clinton contacted her to see if she would consider letting him consider her to be appointed to the Supreme Court. And she determined that her health was fragile at that point, and that even if she could withstand a confirmation, that it would probably, she would not live through a term, and therefore she would not live long on the court, and she declined to take that appointment. So she had those opportunities. I'm going to close by just sharing with you, because I'm asked, do we miss having one? And these are very brief. These are some of the things I do think we miss for someone to speak like she did. If society today, today allows wrongs to go unchallenged, the impression is created that those wrongs have the approval of the majority. It was immigration that taught us that in this country, it does not matter where you come, came from or who your parents were, what counts is who you are. We are one, we Americans, and we reject any intruder who seeks to divide us by race or class. We will not tolerate bigotry under any guise. America's strength is rooted in its diversity. And then from her 1977 Harvard University commencement, what the American people want is simple. They want an America as good as its promise. And what she wanted to be remembered as was as a teacher. And if you'll know, Thomas Jefferson on his tombstone has only that he was the founder of the University of Virginia in the, article of the, the Articles of Religious Freedom in Virginia. And she wanted only one word on the back of her tombstone, which is the only one you find today, and that is the word teacher. She wanted to be remembered as a teacher. So I'll conclude these remarks by sharing with you what some of her students said they got from her. Professor Jordan makes you look at your soul. She has a driving concern about the world. She cares about it. And she wants us to go out there and make a difference in a positive way. Her ideas of social commitment and social consciousness have formed my life. She is convincing us that we have to, in a sense, pay rent for the space that we occupy. I've never met a person who believes so strongly that we can actually change the world, and that gives me confidence that we really can. Above all else, she's taught me that greatness, more than power or fame, is something that you do every day. And so I think that what she would say for who will speak for America, I think she would hope that some of her students and some of those people who hear those words, and she would be pleased to see that some of those things have moved into reality much more than at the time of her death in 1996. So now we'll have a few questions, as I understand it, in an interview. And Barbara said she would drill me, and so I'm ready for that. So here we go. Uh, Barbara Jordan. You got to see her, hear her. You also should know that multiple sclerosis did not prevent her from achieving more than almost any woman or any person could achieve. Probably she achieved more because she knew she had odds. 
So I'm going to ask him some questions. Barbara Jordan was Mac's friend and colleague for 25 years. He knows her. He was there when she was dying. He served with her in the Senate. Barbara Jordan talks a lot about the inner self and the outer self. And we will talk a little bit later about how important faith and religion was to her. My first question this evening to Max is that the list of accolades bestowed upon Barbara Jordan is rich and varied. In 1999, Texas Monthly Magazine named her the role model of the century. I've never heard anyone being the role model of the century. Would you discuss the significance of this prestigious recognition? I think that you have to put that together also with President Clinton's awarding her the National Medal of Freedom. And when he said that she was the most moral voice in American politics, uh, the two go together. And then she was also named the, uh, the ethics czar for Governor Ann Richards. If you were going to be appointed to any significant office in Texas, you had to meet with Barbara Jordan one-on-one -on -one for her to talk to you about the responsibilities. And Barbara believed very strongly that there's a very great difference between public and private service. If you're in the, if you're in the company or you're in the private world, your salary's pub, not public, it's private. You don't have to disclose your budget. You don't have to tell everything you do. But in public service, you really do represent the public, and it's, everything is out there before you, so therefore what you do should be there. And I think to be the role model, I saw it with students at the LBJ school. She literally did change people's lives. She was able to convince them that here is a role model that against many, many obstacles, and it may get into some other things that Barbara may ask me about. But you have to remember that when Barbara grew up, I only touched on it briefly, but she grew up in a very, very poor section of Houston, the Fifth Ward. Her father was the pastor of the Good Hope Missionary Baptist Church, but he also worked on the docks at one of the warehouses. He was a teamster in order to make a living for the family. Her mother was a maid. Uh, she was a large, much darker woman than her sisters. She was not the favorite of her father. The person who was most important to her was her grandfather. And he was a junk dealer. He, he bought rags around the city of Houston. And he's the one that convinced her that you can do anything you set your heart to do. And I think that that's what she conveyed to her students, is that regardless of obstacles, you can do anything you set your mind and heart to do. And Barbara mentioned her MS. But when she died, uh, I was very much involved in the events of her death. And, uh, and I, when I was told that morning that she had died, I had told her longtime friend and companion, Nancy Earl, I said, you know, Nancy, none of us are prepared for a funeral like this. I said, would you mind if I get George Christian, who had been press secretary to President Johnson, press secretary to governors of Texas, if I got him involved? He was a good friend, but not a close friend to Barbara's. And George has said many times, he said, he, first thing he said is that we need to call her doctor get all of her health issues and make them public in the very first statement. So not only did she have MS, she had leukemia, she had diabetes, she had a whole host of illnesses, and she had gutted them out. And uh, there were a couple of times that I took her to places with my wife and put her in a wheelchair. And uh, the difficulty in which she went and did all these things that she did said that she never lost that power that came from what her grandfather told her she could do anything she set her mind to. I think that was why she was such a powerful, powerful role model. Very good. In your book, you write that you take your cue from Henry Steele Cominger, one of the nation's most distinguished historians and teachers who died in March 1998. This consummate teacher said, what every college must do is hold up before the young the spectacle of greatness in history, literature, and life. Why do you hold up Barbara Jordan, Barbara Jordan as a spectacle of greatness? I think in my uh, career, and I'm glad, pleased to have had a multiple career, and, you know, in elected office and in, as a university president and a dean, and you work with young people. And I think that, as Mr. Cominger was being referred to in, on a university campus, 
We don't have those role models so often. We were so fragmented. But here was a woman, here was a person who was able to become part of the American story. Uh, those words that you heard when she said, my faith in the Constitution is whole, is complete, it is total, are now part of the lexicon that make up our history. Uh, because they were spoken by someone who had every reason to reject that Constitution, and yet she embraced it. And she embraced it for all of us. She believed strongly in democracy and liberty. Uh, I guess one of the reasons that I picked that up is when I was a young 14-year-old, I made my first trip to the Statue of Liberty. And at that time, you could still walk up through the torch. And I still have a three-by-five card where I'd written down a quotation of Abraham Lincoln's. And it said, those who give up essential liberty to obtain a little safety deserve neither liberty or safety. Because liberty was the heart of what was Benjamin Franklin was talking about. It was the heart of what Barbara Jordan was talking about. And in many instances, it gets so neglected. Uh, I didn't have time to refer to her speech to the Howard University in 1974. It's really the speech that got me into the book. And there she was speaking about the erosion of civil liberties. And because she felt that she had to speak up about a lot of places they were getting into individual lives and how that was not liberty, it was the, ex the op opposite of it. And often I've quoted, a, which I think Barbara, part and parcel of her philosophy, but there's a quotation that comes out of Germany and uh, a Lutheran pastor named Martin Niemöller, and some of you may know the quote, but he is really chastising the intellectual, the intel intelligentsia of Germany uh, for not speaking up as Hitler was coming to power. And if I can remember it, and I don't have any notes, but I think he said, he said, first they came for the communist, and I s did not speak up because I was not a communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak up because I was not a Jew. And then they came for the trade unionist, and I did not speak up because I was not a tra trade unionist. And then they came for the Catholics, and I did not speak up because I was not a Catholic. And then he said, and then they came for me, and there was no one to speak up. I think that embodies why I think Barbara Jordan, she was one who spoke up. She was one who was willing to meet the challenge. And I think she's a marvelous role model and someone who is a spectacle of greatness because of the courage that probably came out of many of the infirmities that she had, and she rose above them. And you share an experience. You and Barbara were both in the Senate together. And there's an experience that happened on the floor one afternoon. And it's around the world, the words, you'll hear me when I want you to hear me. And that is what Barbara <coughs> Jordan said to you. Um, ex talk about that. Barbara and I became very good friends. We had 12 or 13 committee assignments in the Senate. And it was back in an olden day when you didn't have technology. So you didn't have any postings. You didn't have electronic screens of any kind. And if you didn't follow it very carefully, you didn't know what was going on. So I had developed a system, had the bill and pros and cons that my staff had put together. So if something came up I didn't know about, I could at least have a little information about how to vote. And I actually took a lot of pride in it. I thought it was a good little system and others barred it. And this is toward the very end of a session. And I'm three seats up here and there are only 31 members of the Texas Senate. So it's a very small, and very powerful body. And Barbara's in one of two seats here in the corner and she's standing up, obviously passing a bill. And I have earth, no earthly idea what she's talking about. So instead of going through the chair, I just looked at her about this far away and I said, Barbara, I can't hear you. And she looked at me very sternly. She says, Max, you'll hear me when I want you to hear me. <laughs> and when it came time to vote aye, I voted aye. I have no idea what I voted for. <laughs> I, ho I hope it was a good bill. But that was the demeanor she had, and then even when, we, when, she was, when I was dean and she was held a chair on the faculty, and she usually sat here because she was in a wheelchair. In faculty meetings, many of you here are members of faculty, it can be very contentious and very difficult, and sometimes talking an awful lot about so little, little bitty thing. <laughs> And it just drives you nuts sometimes. And we'd be having one of these meetings at the LBJ school. <coughs> and finally, I'd be in desperation. I'd look over at her. She'd look at me. Dean, I think we've discussed this long enough. 
I'd say, I believe, so we took a vote, no one was bound to challenge her, and that was the end of that discussion. So she, so she, kept, she kept the ability to do that. In your book, Barbara Jordan, speaking the truth with eloquent thunder, now think of what you saw and you heard. You talk about uh, when Barbara Jordan almost drowned in 1988, and you've mentioned it uh, earlier, uh, and you indicate that her life was different with her brush so close to death. In what areas do you, did this shape her life differently? She was a woman who had a, a lot of privacy she never did. Even these health elements, elements did not come out until at the time of her death. Uh, she felt that was private, it was not public information. And uh, I think that incident of death, I was at my mother's in the Texas Panhandle and got the word that she had almost drowned and I flew back immediately and as I say, I broke in. I, I'm, when I was in college, I sold Bibles for about five years door to door so I know how to get into places you're not supposed to be. <laughs> and I went to the hospital late at night because it's way after hours and, and they were closed and I found a custodian and talked him into letting me take me down to where she was on a gurney and I literally, as I said earlier, held her hand through that night. But after that, she called a few of us in because they weren't sure she would live through the week. And I spent over an hour with her, and we didn't talk politics, we didn't talk government, we didn't talk public policy. What we really talked about were values, things that are important about faith. And I would not want to try to describe her faith, even though she grew up in, in, a, in a Baptist church. Uh, it was still very important to her. I have a number of her books that are friend Nancy asked me to come down and pick up. I looked at those markings and they all indicate that faith was always something that ran through what she did. And if you look in the book and you read, and unfortunately this is not mine, I borrowed this from my friend Gary Clark, I left mine in, in the hotel, but she gave a speech in 1970, gave a prayer at the National Prayer Breakfast, and later she spoke to, uh, when President Reagan was there, she gave the major address at the National Prayer Breakfast. And you can't read the prayer or the speech without knowing that faith was very much a part of her life. And I think she grew up with it. And at her funeral, it was at the same church where she grew up, which later burned down. But uh, the preacher who had just come there from Brooklyn, a big, tall man, about six foot six, very powerful. And you had the President of the United States, most of the people in the cabinet, the governor and the mayor, all the dignitaries that you could ask for. And I want to segue into something about that. But the preacher says, if if Barbara, Sister Barbara were here and I asked her, what should I do for an audience like this? And she's sitting in her wheelchair at the back of the church. She would say, preach, Pastor, preach. And so he preached that day. He preached a great sermon. But I think it was part of what she felt, why the hymns were so important to her, why it was part of the fabric of her life. But it was not something she wanted to put on a cuff of her sleeve. It was just part of who she was. So I think that was significant. And, uh, the part that I wanted to segue to that might not come up in a question, one of the most moving memories for me was driving from Austin with the woman who wrote her, her biography, <coughs> Mary Beth Rogers, and a couple of other good friends. And because kind of part of the extended family, we sat with the family in the first four rows. It rained all the way down there. It was raining when we got there. And as far as the eye could see in the rain, you had ordinary people that would not get into the service. They were coming to pay tribute to this woman who was so important to their lives. And I think that symbol is probably more important than anything. Well, you talked about the prayer breakfast, the national prayer breakfast, and recently had the opportunity to look at one on TV with President Obama. And so I'm thinking about the prayer breakfast because you mentioned <coughs> in 1978 she gave the opening prayer for the national prayer breakfast in Washington, D.C., and then in 84, as you mentioned, uh, she was the main speaker along with the newly elected President Reagan. And here are a few of her words. In quotes, know that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. She pointed out to the huge crowd that morning that those were the closing words of President John F. Kennedy's inaugural address. Would you say that Barbara Jordan was challenging lawmakers and others there to be God's stewards on this earth? No doubt. No doubt. I think she felt very strongly 
that we are stewards of this earth, we're stewards of each other, and that was part of the responsibility we have in passing legislation. And I think she was challenging the President of the United States, she was challenging all those legislators who were there and staffers that it's not just a job, it's really a stewardship role that you have, and I think it was very powerful to her. When we start talking about speaking ability, and you addressed this a little bit at dinner this evening, we talk about President Obama and his speaking abilities and the power of words to reach people. And I heard you open with how powerful Barbara Jordan's speech was. What makes an orator, what really makes people listen to them versus someone who just speaks well? I think with Barbara, it's almost when she challenged me on the floor of the Senate, Max, you'll hear me when I want you to hear me. Now, someone could have said that to me, but it, it's part of my being now. It's part of my resonating. And I think she learned that the word is so powerful. And uh, she spoke in cadences. I think she spoke in cadences that she learned from the black preachers. Uh, I think she learned, from, and then she learned from Dr. Freeman, who was her debate coach at Texas Southern. I heard a group of 12 students of hers when I did a program at Texas Southern, and you would almost think they're being prepared to be Barbara Jordans in the, in the way they speak. But he spoke at her funeral, and uh, I've been on programs with him before. He's still, after 57 years, still teaching at Texas Southern. But I think he, he said, you know, in debates, you can talk about the all the facts and the figures, but it's in the delivery and how you tell those facts and how you make an audience feel that they really are true, that they are something that makes a difference. And Barbara believed that. I mean, I've heard her, I've read her speeches and different things, and on the paper they don't, they don't read that much, but when you hear it, and one of my sad feelings is that many of her speeches were not recorded. Her Howard commencement was not recorded. She got the first major award that a woman was ever given by National B'nai B'rith. It was not recorded. There are schools all over this country named for her, and the speeches given at that occasion are not recorded. Otherwise, you could have a, another book and another DVD of a number of the speeches that were there. Uh, and so I think that what you really learned is that she wasn't trying to make speeches to be preserved. She was making speeches for that audience at that time in that place. And that's a uh, that's very unique talent to have. Now Barbara Jordan served six years in the Senate and she decided that she was leaving. That was something she decided she wanted to do. And then she went to the LBJ um, Presidential Library and Museum and she taught classes. Right. And her classes were extremely popular. In fact they were so popular that they had a lottery to determine what students would be able to get into her classes. She loved young people. And yet we know today, if we were to ask some young people and mention Barbara Jordan, they would say, who? There's some people not so young. You say Barbara Jordan, they go, who? And then other people you mention Barbara Jordan and they smile and say, oh yes, oh yes. What can we do? When we start talking about the importance of history, what can we do to make sure that young people, <coughs> older people, know about those people before them that laid the foundation for what many of us are able to enjoy today? I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm the product of a of a broad liberal arts education at Baylor University for which I've always been grateful. Uh, I took a lot of history courses and English courses and language courses that I never would have taken. Many young people today don't have that opportunity. They get into a narrow channel very quickly. And, uh, and I think that uh, the exposure to history and is something that, that many don't have. And so I think you almost have to start it in, there's one bright spot out of the 
time. I've been, this book was not done for the broad audience. As I said, it was done for her students. It's dedicated to her students. But I was asked to speak to a group of about almost 300 teachers, junior high teachers, who are part of a program which is called Education in the Law. And I spoke to them. Every one of them bought a book and they had me sign it. And all of them have written notes back of how they've now incorporated it into their junior high classes. And so all of a sudden, from an early age, it's now become an important part. Uh, the university where I was president at West Texas State, and they have an honors class for all their honor students. And the book is now, probably because I was there, but now they become, it's become part of the curriculum for that honor. They do an introductory course, and they all study Barbara Jordan. And these are kids in the West Texas area. Uh, they would not normally know about Barbara Jordan. But the notes that come back are just terribly moving when they tell you about what it means to have been exposed to a person like this. So I think it probably says an awful lot about the movement to reinvigorate our public schools, to have committed teachers who want to teach about Barbara Jordan and other historical figures, and so that young people at least have a beginning point in which they can know and have an opportunity to be moved by someone they might not have run across before. Knowing Barbara Jordan so well, what do you think she would say about the nomination of Barack Obama and now the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama? I think she would be extremely happy to begin with. I think a lot of what she did in working both sides of the aisle in a lot of issues of trying to work within the club uh, was really to try to lay a foundation for a Barack Obama to come along and have the opportunity. I think that to me is why this letter from Alice Walker is so very, very important in my own thinking where she's really talking about this long history and, uh, and why I think she, what she fi finishes up with, which I didn't read, but I won't go into the read, but I will just tell you her concluding. I was not prepared for it. Just a one line after she's written this beautiful letter. We, not you, we are the ones we have been waiting for. We are the ones we've been waiting for. And I think that's probably what Barbara Jordan would say. In 1965, as you know, Barbara Jordan had run for the Texas Senate. An astute student of Texas legislative procedure, her performance was so effective that her 30 white male colleagues named her outstanding freshman senator during her first year in office. Now remember Barbara Jordan was the first African American to be elected from the South. Why do you think 30 white men who may not have even voted for if they could would have bestowed such an honor? And some of those people were very uh, unkind when she first came. And many of them used very derogatory language. It wasn't long before my time there, but I've heard the stories. And I think it was the power of her personality and the fact that this was not just someone that's here, but it's someone who's here to make a difference. It's someone who's here on equal footing with each of them. And I think at the end they came to respect that that she was there to be a player and that she just embodied uh, the right things. And uh, in knowing some of those people, I knew their history and there's some of those folks in those graves where I said, I wasn't sure that she would want to be buried. I, mean, if I, told, I haven't told that to this group, but she's buried in a spot that uh, the old hill had been closed and I looked around and many of those people were from that generation that uh, it would have been very unpopular to have had a a black person buried in the set of these white male graves. And uh, I told the group earlier, I said, if we had buried her there, uh, she would have haunted me the rest of my life. <laughs> but these are some of the people who voted for her for that honor, because I think she had earned their respect. And I think that goes back, I keep going back to her grandfather. He told her she could do it. She knew she could do it. She did it. You worked with her on the Senate floor? You were there when she was dying. You had your quiet time together when you could discuss many things. She was like your mentor in many ways. 
but as you say, she was there four years before you arrived. What do you miss most about your friend? I was asked, you know, about her, but I think that I missed her laugh, her goodwill. You know, you don't see that because we look at her this powerful person. She was also one of your best friends. She would have her friends to come down to her house about every two weeks. Because she, they had to go to her house because she was very difficult for her to get out and around. And what they did was to sing hymns. They came in to sing hymns. And when she could play the guitar, she played the guitar. And later when she couldn't, she would belt it out. My friend Bill Hobby, who was many, many years long Lieutenant Governor of Texas, remembers being at the event after Jim Wright was elected Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. Barbara's still in the house. And they go to an event and a luncheon or dinner or whatever. And at the end of it, Barbara gets up and leads the whole group in singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And he said, you know, it was one of those moments that you'll never forget. And unfortunately, I talked to Speaker Wright and several others, hoping in his archives I would find that a recording of that song, but it was not there. Uh, so I, and I meant, you know, I think you missed too, uh, with the symphony in Houston and several symphonies, some of those great musical pieces she's narrated and put together. And I think that that's part of what you miss is her spirit. Uh, my wife and I brought her home when she received the Texan of the Year Award and going and coming and how very difficult it was to move her. Uh, but through all that, I mean, coming back, you know, it was such a moving moment for her. And a story that I will tell, and I might get emotional telling it because I have not done it very often, but I was asked to be a speaker when the New York, New York University dedicated the annual review of the law to Barbara Jordan. So John Bradamus and, uh, and Rodino and I were the three speakers. And I went first, very short speech, and uh, before Barbara was recognized. And then afterward, I kind of went over to the side, and she always had to have a traveling aid to, to get around. And I knew the aide, and I asked her, I said, well, where are they taking you to dinner this evening? And she said, well, we're going back to the hotel and have sandwiches. And I said, you're not going out. So I, my brother-in-law is an architect in New York City, and so we had made plans to go to a place over in Soho, which was a new restaurant that everybody was going to, and we had reservations. And not, it's not Tom and Jerry's, it's something like that, but two names. So I called my brother-in-law and I said, Carl, would you mind to see if uh, that they can make room for Barbara Jordan and, and her traveling aide? And I said, be bold enough to tell them it's Barbara Jordan. And uh, he called me back and he said they, they said they would do it. <clears throat> and it's a place about half this, you know, not like New York restaurant, it's very small, but tables packed together. But they had put in a runway for her wheelchair because I told them she was in a wheelchair. But the part that's emotional for me is that they had one of those vans where you roll in the car and you roll it out. And when we got there, there was an African-American gentleman who elegantly dressed and he had heard on the inside that she was coming. And he stood at the curb and waited and waited and waited until she got out. And then they had their private conversation. But it was very important for him to have this opportunity to have this one-on-one -on -one with Barbara Jordan. And then you went into this restaurant in the heart of the city. Everybody there knew who it was and no one ever intruded on her privacy to come over and speak. I don't know what a presence is, but she had it. You got me now. <laughs> <laughs> One of our missions here at the Dole Institute of Politics is to make sure that our young people are civically engaged and that they are involved in not only political arena, but just a whole spectrum. And we have young people here this evening. What would Barbara Jordan say to them if she was sitting where you are? She would look you right in the eye and would tell you, as one of her quotes I used a moment ago, you have a price to pay for the space that you occupy on this earth, and you can make a difference. Go henceforth and make a difference. Would you turn to page 95 of your book? And I want him to just read the last portion, right towards the end. And I think it will tell you a little bit more about the Barbara Jordan you know or the Barbara Jordan you did not know. 
she's been my hero for a long time. And she was my mom and dad's hero. And my mom would be so pleased to know that we were celebrating Black History Month with Barbara Jewel. This would be from the end of Bill Moyer's eulogy at her memorial service. The founders would have been lucky to have had her in that constitutional convention. And if she had been present, it would have taken far less time for Barbara Jordan to be recognized as a whole person in the sight of the law or for this country to fulfill its promise. As it is, the good fortune has been yours and mine. Just when we de des de despaired of finding a hero, she showed up to give the sign of democracy do you know what the odds of that happening had to be? That in a universe existing billions of years with 50 billion galaxies and more on a planet of modest size circling an ordinary sun in an unexceptional galaxy that you and I would have arrived in the same time zone as Barbara Jordan. At such a moment of serendipity to be touched by this one woman by this one woman's life to encounter her spirit and her faith. This is no small thing. This is grace. We could go on, but I'm going to stop here so that you'll have an opportunity to ask some questions. And as I mentioned earlier, faith was extremely important to Barbara, Barbara Jordan. Me too. And she was able to have the political sense, and she never had to deny her religious side. And she walked a very thin balance, but she was able to do it. Anything else in closing? I'll be glad to questions. fire from that group. Any questions you might have? This one here, do we have a microphone here, Julia, please? Oh, right here. I take it from what you're saying that uh, Barbara Jordan was a close personal friend and this is a very personal kind of book that you've written about her. Uh, and I'm wondering to what extent you focus in parts of the book about positions she took on significant issues and what other publications are there about Barbara Jordan that uh, gives a, 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 a fairly uh, broad perspective on positions as well as speeches on significant issues of the time other than you know what you showed in the film etc. <coughs> Very and your, your book as you describe it I think is tremendously powerful and I'm looking forward to reading it. Thank you. Uh, that's a very good question. The, I have a reference here to what I call three contemporary issues. Uh, one of them I've already referred to in my opening remarks and that was the confirmation of Supreme Court justices. I think she laid out a standard that she felt. And she started out by saying that she, I don't come to this just as a follower. I don't come here just as a Democrat. There are reasons why I oppose this nomination. Because Robert Bork had been confirmed as a circuit judge unanimously. He had a distinguished record. But these reasons that she cited were reasons she opposed it. Uh, the other one is faith. And, and, and unfortunately, those are not recorded. But you do have her speech. Uh, for, for its politics and faith. And the other issue that I think is, and this is a failing of the Congress, I think, because she starts off her comments by saying she's glad to see that the Congress is now up to date and has technology. So somewhere in the houses of Congress, her testimony on immigration are recorded. Now, can they find them? Not for me. <laughs> so they're not in here on the DVD. You have to read it. But she was appointed chairman of the Immigration Committee. This is in about 94, 95 by President Clinton. The leadership in the House and the Senate appoint four Republicans and four Democrats to be on that committee. And Barbara leads them to unanimously make recommendations on a very sensitive issue of immigration. So that one is in here. Uh, she died before the final report. So if you wanted to do more work, you'd probably have to look at that. But it really would be her, her product. Uh, I would recommend to everyone here uh, the biography of her by Mary Beth Rogers, which is called Barbara Jordan, an American Hero. I mean, there you really get a lot of detail, and Mary Beth was a very careful writer, 
and, uh, and wrote that book. She also did the book on Ernie Cortez, who was a, uh, has had a lot of impact in the political world. And, but uh, those are two books that she's done. But this one is done very, very well. It gives a lot of detail and more. But as Barbara mentioned, her time in Congress was only six years. So she really doesn't have that long a record there. And probably her greatest influence will be one that maybe there's a scholar here, maybe one of the young people will be the one to write about it, would be what some of her students have done and where they are making a significant contribution to public policy issues. Mm -hmm. Another she, question. Do you want to finish? No, I just will say, and you know, she did. She did join in filibustering against putting the sales tax on food and drugs. That was before I came to the Senate, but she led the effort, and that's discussed in Mary Beth Rogers' book. You have another question? Yes. Oh, here's one. Right up here, please. You mentioned that the in the last days you were um, very close to. Ms. Jordan and had uh, very extensive conversations outside of politics. During those conversations, did you learn anything new about her? And if not, um, what was the most potent as aspect of those conversations? The two conversations that have been referred to, one was the, at that time after she almost drowned in 88. And then the other was uh, <coughs> when she was uh, in the hospital about the 22nd of December before she died on the 16th of January. Uh, I, uh, when I would go see her in the hospital or an event like that, then I, I would always write out on a little three by five card one or two sentences because if you ask permission, you were always told she doesn't have visitors. And so I kind of went prepared. But uh, probably the most important one would be uh, the one toward the end of her life. Uh, because I did that and a nurse took the card in and before I got away she said well she'd like for you to come in and so I went in and she and I are visiting and uh, her doctor comes in and I offered to leave and uh, she asked me to stay and uh, I was there when she was told that she probably would die within a few weeks and uh, heard that but I think the reason that Barbara asked me to stay is that she made me promise that I would not cancel her ethics course, which was to start on January 20th. <laughs> she fully intended to be there to teach that course. It tells you how strong the, the desire to be a teacher was. And it leads to a story that's not directly related to yours, but it picks up something that Barbara had asked me about earlier, and I kind of hinted at it a moment ago. But uh, a few days later, I knew she had gone home. She felt if she were going to die, she, you know, she might want to be at her home. So I just had an intuition to go down there and I went down and two of her very close friends were there and they said well Max we're glad you came because you know Barbara never thought she would die and we laughed and she was having some difficulty with the breathing machine in the room and I never did see her I, last time I saw her was at that time when she was told she would die and uh, I went away with those three assignments one was to call Bill Moyers and ask if he would do, speak at a memorial service the other was to call her lawyer and say She's going to probably die pretty soon, so you need to get ready. And the third was to pick a place for her to be buried at the, because she had no place to be buried. No, no. So I had an appointment the next afternoon to go to the state cemetery, and the fellow in charge of it was a fellow who'd worked in the Senate, and he referred to me as Senator Sherman and to her as Senator Jordan. And I had a, this, this, this meeting set up, and she died the next morning. So another friend and I met my appointment. And we went out there, it doesn't tell what she said, but it does refer to her because that afternoon before I asked her friend, Nancy, I said, Nancy, what am I looking for for a place for Barbara to be buried? And she said, well, you know, Barbara, it needs to be on the highest hill and it needs to be next to Stephen F. Austin. <laughs> and Stephen F. Austin is the founder of Texas, you know. <laughs> So we had a good laugh about that, and so now she's dead, and we go out there, and Harry says there are three spots on the old hill, which has been closed for a hundred years, but it's open now. The first one I mentioned was this place that she would haunt me if she were buried there, and he, he thought that was the best place because all these tombstones around were men from another era, very, very prejudiced people, and it was not going to be good for me. <laughs> uh, and so we looked at the one on the top of the hill, 
and Stan measured. He said, this he thinks this is it. And I said, Harry, you uh, said there was a third place. He said, well, it, there is, but Senator Jordan was a big woman. And he said, I don't think it'll work because people back in those days were very small. And I said, you know, you have a couple of people here, let's measure it, and they did. And he said, lo and behold, Senator, it'll work. And that's where she's buried. And would you believe it is on the top of the highest hill and it corners on the tombstone of Stephen F. Austin. <laughs> about the power she has. <laughs> the power? Oh, well, I, I just said the power from the grave. You know, she had it. Even the book in the beginning, you'll see a little reference. I'd worked on a book. She and I and Paul Burke, who's the executive editor of Texas Monthly, were going to do a book, an anthology on teaching ethics, borrowing heavily from her. And then she dies, and Paul becomes executive editor, and it kind of languishes. And uh, and I get a research assistant, and we put together the book. And presses don't like to do anthologies. They're too expensive. And and so I kind of let it hang there. And, and I'm traveling with my wife to Montana. And I've been driving from Austin, Texas. And there were conventions along the way. And we finally couldn't get a place into Colorado Springs. And I, I was absolutely, totally exhausted. I had not thought of Barbara Jordan in weeks or months. I don't know how long. And at 8 o'clock that morning after getting in about midnight, I wake up with this feeling, Max, get off your rear end. You've got a book to write and I want you to get it, get it done. Now, I don't know where that comes from, but let me tell you, you don't want to mess with this lady. <laughs> you want to meet that thing you have? Which one? <laughs> when you said you don't want to mess with Barbara Jordan? <laughs> no. <laughs> she, she was powerful. She was powerful. Yes, ma'am, another question here. University of Texas Law School. Is there anyone that is forces on Barbara Jordan or no? Or, or there is a, uh, there's a there's a publication, uh, the Journal in the Law, w which was dedicated to her, but there is no one teaching it. And uh, <coughs> so at, at this point, I would hate to tell you that there's no one teaching the course in ethics that she taught, and that's part of what happens, you know, and. Uh, when I got into the book and no longer teaching, there's, there's not a course being taught and references to it. The book has taken on a life, which is kind of an amazing one. It's now into its fifth printing, and uh, and all of a sudden there have been two or three people say, could we maybe revive the book on teaching ethics? Because she really was that moral voice. So it may be that, I don't know if I'm young enough to do it, but I might get some help and see if we can put it together, someone that could be used in teaching. I know Phil Bobbitt well. Philip, uh, but he's you know, kind of on leave and doing different things, and he's writing about international affairs as in a couple of books out. But, but, uh, uh, but he would be someone who knows her. Paul Burka, Texas Monthly, would be a marvelous person if he could ever get free of the responsibilities at the magazine. We have time for one more question, and I'm looking over at the student section. Come on with a good one. You've got one there somewhere. Oh, there's one there, and I see another one. So we'll come to you. Okay, right here. Could you just tell us about the things about Barbara Jordan that most people didn't know about her that we might find surprising? I don't know. We've talked about a number of them. I think the most, the one that, there, there's a fascinating little story where she caused me as dean of the LBJ school a great deal of grief. Uh, she had an uncanny ability to do that. Uh, but she was giving a press uh, interview, and a reporter who knew her very well from the Houston Chronicle was seated on the first row, and he tossed her a softball question at the end. The press conference was over, and somewhere in the answer to that, she made the statement that women were more compassionate than men. I cannot tell you, for three weeks I went through a picket line of men to get into the school, and I had to answer a lot of questions from the press and, and deal with that issue uh, because she had, uh, in, in the context, I wasn't, I wasn't there, so I didn't even hear it. But little stories like that, I think, get lost. She said uh, they were more passionate than men. More compassionate. What's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> Bill, get ready for the, get ready for the pickets now. <laughs> It took me a while to kind of figure out where he was going. 
you know, Barbara mentioned in cases, I don't want to cut off any questions in that one light. I don't want to miss anyone. Well, we have this one right here. Would you go ahead and ask your question, please? I'm positive. Uh, well, my question is, one of the things that I'm looking at in my studies is this idea that campaigns are sort of um, emotions versus rationality, and should we make our decisions in politics based on emotions versus rationality? And I was wondering if you could comment on um, Barbara Jordan's view on that, because it sounds like she's a very passionate person, but also weighs issues very carefully. And so I wanted to know if you could comment on that. If you In the book, you'll see there's some pictures with her and Lyndon Johnson and uh, is I, I think she was always missed to President Carter for not naming her, her her as Attorney General. He did name a very marvelous person. I mean, Griffin Bell was an outstanding choice. I'm convinced that had she been named his Attorney General, he might have been reelected. You know, as you go back and look at the history. And that's his loss, isn't it? That is. It is his loss. But, you know, she had a very difficult race to be elected to Senate because she had not been elected to the House. And she ran against a fellow named Curtis Graves. And Curtis was bombastic, and he had a lot of following. He'd been elected to the House in, the, in that area. And she beat him by about 83-17 uh, in that race because she didn't know how to campaign. She also knew that you better pay attention to the basics of a campaign. And yet she had that amazing ability to uh, connect. Emote might be the word, but to connect with people. It wasn't just a white paper. But when she spoke about something, you really knew she cared about it. And then she never had a campaign after that of any consequence. So I think, you know, she, and that's the best way to run of all is un unopposed. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so she, and then to beat all your opponents the first time around. So if, you, if you're going to run or manage someone, Bill's managed campaigns, and he can tell you more about campaigns. But uh, I think that uh, emotion's a great part of it if you want to move people to show up and to vote and to be there. Uh, it's a very important part. I was going to mention one thing, just to, what, the last part of her prayer, and think about this. She is only, uh, she's only a very, 1978, she is, uh, well, she's 30, 38 years old, maybe somewhere in there, and she gives this prayer to the prayer breakfast, but she concludes, which I think is such a marvelous thing for elected officials, guide us in our decisions and grant us the wisdom, the courage, and the selflessness to discern the difference between good and bad, between fact and fiction, between reality and illusion. Oh, I really think we should thank Max for coming this evening <laughs> and sharing with us. But I also would like to thank Gary Clark. Just raise your hand, please. Because, Gary, just put your hand up in there. Gary had asked uh, and made us aware that uh, Max Sherman was interested in visiting us. And I think it was really our honor to have him. I hope you learned a little bit more about the Barbara Jordan you knew or the Barbara Jordan you did not know. And I hope you'll realize that, you know, I mentioned part of our mission was civic engagement to make sure our students on campus are more engaged, but also it's for our community to give them the opportunity to have diverse speakers here at the Dole Institute of Politics and always a question and answer period so that you can get personally involved as well. I thank all of you so much this evening for coming for our Black History Month. And I will ask you to continue to come and know that this is not just for the University of Kansas, not just for the Lawrence community, but for the whole state of Kansas. And our mission is just to make sure that you hear all of the opinions and decide for yourself what you want to think. And Max, it was an absolute pleasure. And I can't tell you, I've been excited all day waiting to do this. So we thank you so much, and we will have the book signing in the back. Remember, you get a video, and like I said, he's making nothing on it. <laughs> so this will be your contribution. Thank you so very much. Hope it makes your